Well, thank you for inviting me here today. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's happened uh, with the dam removal. Uh, the title of my talk is The Effect of Salmon Colonization on Ecosystem Patterns and Processes. So the main question that, that we've been trying to tackle is how does salmon colonization influence ecosystems and patterns and processes? And uh, any opinions expressed today are my own and not necessarily shared or represented by NOAA. <laughs> we always have to say that. Um, one of the things about the Elwha Dam removal, uh, there's a lot of different groups that are involved in the Elwha Dam removal. And so this is just a smattering of the people that are working on this. So it's a large process. It's a lot of money over a long period of time. And so I just want to acknowledge all the work people that are working on it. So this is the Elwha Dam right here. Uh, as Joe said, the majority of it is in Olympic National Park. And uh, there were two dams built in the early 1900s. Uh, the Elwha Dam is the lower dam right over here, and uh, the Glines Canyon Dam is uh, right over here, and uh, with the dams, it basically blocked off 90% of the watershed to anatomous fish. So anatomous fish are basically fish that spawn in the freshwater, and then move out to the salt water, and then come back. And so these are some of the species that were affected. Uh, so all different kinds of salmon, uh, sculpin, and then non-native species too, including brook trout. So one thing that we know about salmon is that there's been a big decline over the last hundred years. So the Elwha is no different. So about 98% reduction in the population. But what people don't know is that there's been a shift in the species composition as well. So. Historically, uh, pink salmon were the, the, the dominant species in the Elwha. But if you go there today, what you'll see is uh, Chinook salmon, steelhead, and coho salmon dominating. Now, all the populations are in very low abundance relative to what was historic. So this gives you an idea of what the population numbers are. So we're talking about something in the tens to the thousands where before it was probably in the hundreds to the tens of thousands for each of these species. And some of the species, in particular Chinook salmon, um, are uh, dominated by hatchery fish. So as Joe said, the uh, Elwha Act was passed in 1992. And if you read the Act, it's for the removal of the dams and full restoration of the Elwha ecosystem and native anatomous fishes. So 20 years later, uh, we started actually removing the dams. And um, this is just a photograph of what the dam removal looked like in March of 2012. Um, and this is in November of 2012 at Glines Canyon. So I'll talk a little bit about the dams themselves. Um, but before I do that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the biggest issue that surrounded this dam removal was what's gonna happen to all the sediment. So, uh, about 20 million cubic meters of sediment accumulated in the reservoirs um, over that time period from when they were built to 2011. And the majority of this sediment was finer material, sand or less, um, and, and then a minority was coarser material. And about 40% of it was predicted to erode downstream. So this photograph here it just shows you what the delta looks like in the upper reservoir. So there was a lot of predictions. Um, suspended sediment levels would be really high. There'd be temporary deposition of the finer material in pools in the main river. Um, there'd be a connection of the main river with the floodplain because the bed of the river would actually build up in a grade. And then we'd actually see the establishment of a beach in the estuary. So I'm going to focus on this general question of what has occurred with the removal of the Elwha River Dam. So I'm going to talk about it two ways. The first way I'm going to talk about it is by location. So I'll tell you a little bit about the dams and the former reservoirs. I'll tell you a little bit about the near shore and then the river ecosystem. And then I'll talk about the processes. So how sediment has moved and been routed through the system and then how fish have recolonized it. And then I'll touch upon how these two processes have affected things that we see. Uh, the revegetation of the reservoirs, um, the food web itself in the river system, and then linkages to basically uh, terrestrial animals such as birds and river otters. 
So this is what the Elwha Dam looked like uh, in September of 2011 when they started to take it down. Again, it was completed in 1912 and it was about a little over 100 feet high. And then if you think about it in terms of sediment, there was about 5 million cubic meters. So you can see from this graphic, it was about the size of, you know, the amount of the Empire State Building and an Olympic Oval track. And the majority of that was silt or clay. So the dam removal started in September of 2011. And then by April of 2012, the dam was gone and it was passable. And the way that the dam removal worked was that they would actually take the dam or the river and create an, uh, a coffer dam upstream and shunt the water to one side while they deconstructed the other side. And so they flipped back and forth. And eventually, um, you can see here, the river's on one side and then the river's on the other side. Um, and then eventually, it was passable. So the Glines Canyon Dam was a lot uh, more of a process because it was twice as big, um, about 200 feet high, and it had a considerable amount of more material behind it. So about almost 16 million cubic meters of sediment. Again, you can see the Empire State Building here, so we're talking about quite a bit of sediment. And the dam removal process really was driven by the, how sediment would move downstream. So this one was a little bit different. Um, this one, uh, you couldn't necessarily go from side to side, but what they did is they basically brought in a 5,000 pound jackhammer here on a floating barge that would go back and forth and um, basically take down a couple feet of the dam each day. Um, you talk about OSHA issues with that guy right there. So anyway, um, so it, anyway, it was not exactly an easy task, but eventually they got the dam down to this point where uh, they had to actually detonate um, and basically blow portions of it up. And then by May of 2014, um, or actually, sorry, by the fall of 2014, the dam was actually pass, or the former dam site was passable to fish. So again, like I said, they had to use explosives in parts of it. So one of the main questions was how has the sediment supply changed? So what I'm showing you here is on the x-axis is just date. Um, the light blue is the suspended sediment levels below the dam and the black is the suspended sediment levels above. So within one year from the dam removal beginning in the Elwha Dam to the dam removal ending, we had about 8% uh, of all the sediment mobilized. And this is just um, sediment basically from the Aldwell Reservoir or the lower dam itself. Now, Lake Mills was gone and that's the upper reservoir where the majority of the sediment was. And so once Lake Mills was gone, um, so this was filled up, this was filled with water. Now once it was gone, this whole area could then be eroded by the river. And that's really where the majority of the sediment was and is, and that's when the suspended sediment levels really increased because the river had access to all that sediment. So about 40% of all the stored sediment has been released to date. Um, and this is the stored sediment in uh, Mills Reservoir, the upper one, and here's the one in uh, the lower reservoir. Um, and you can see that the majority of it, uh, the, different, the different coloration is how much is there versus how much was actually released. Or sorry, um, that's incorrect, it's the two different reservoirs. So this just gives you a visual of what it looks like. So water is flowing from the bottom to the top here, and this uh, red circle is the Boulder River coming in. So I just want to kind of give you guys a visual of what this looks like on the ground. So you can see as the reservoir kind of goes away, as the dam goes down, um, the river starts to show up. And so this is what Boulder Creek looked like in September of 2011. So water's flowing away from you here, and the main river is flowing away from you from right to left. So if you were standing at this spot in September of 2011 when they started the dam removal, this is what, occurred, this is what it looked like. And this is what it looked like in January 2012. So the former forest floor is right down here. So it down cut quite a bit because the base level was dropping um, at a relatively rapid rate. So I'll just give you another uh, vantage point for this. Um, in September of 2011, this is what the former Aldwell Reservoir surface looked like. So this is um, the same location that Joe showed you where his, uh, his uh, wife was standing was probably somewhere out over here. 
Um, but this is what it looked like um, in September 2011 when they just started the dam removal and the water's flowing towards you here. If you go out to in January of 2015, this is what it looks like. So you can see all this wood that is accumulated in this reservoir area and it's stacking up against some of those old tree stumps that uh, that Joe showed you there. So a lot of it, a lot of the sediment has now eroded as you can see. Um, and this is what some of the tree stumps look like. So you can see where the reservoir surface or the where the uh, sediment bottom was and, and this was obviously below that. Probably one of the more dramatic places where we've seen really considerable change is the mouth of the Elwha. So here's the mouth of the Elwha. This is the Strait of Juan de Fuca right here. Um, and I'm just giving you that yellow circle as an indicator just so you can see where you are. So what uh, the USG has predicted was that the majority of the sediment would actually move eastward with the long shore drift towards Port Angeles. And that a, por a good portion of it though would actually stay right here at the mouth and then some of it would move westward. So this is what the strait looked like during the dam removal process. You can see there's quite a bit of sediment being com coming from the Elwha. However, if you uh, had a boat and you just kind of drove through this, uh, it, the water would clear up because the majority of the sediment was much finer material at that time. And it's really just suspended in the water column. It wasn't exactly dropping out at the mouth. But eventually it did. And so if you were standing here uh, before dam removal, you could basically walk out two kilometers now into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. So you can see where the shorelines have increased over time. So here in 2011 and by 2014 is over here. And these are now becoming tidal channels. So tidal influence used to go all the way up to here. Now it basically goes up to here. So there's been a really dramatic change in this area. Um, there's actually a Dungeness crab fishery for the lower Awa tribe that's occurring already down here. Um, so they're seeing really dramatic changes in that area. Um, and obviously the biota that live in there, uh, uh, sea pens and moon snails have also been affected by all that sedimentation though. So there's both positive and negative effects with this. So this gives us an idea of what happened in the river itself. I just want you to focus in on this black line over here. So um, this is the bed of the river right here. So dam removal began in September of 2011 and the bed really didn't change all that much. And the Elwha Dam was removed here. So you see a slight increase in the bed. So a little bit of sediment increasing the bed elevation. But as, as I showed you before, once that Mills Reservoir area was butting against uh, the former uh, dam site, that's when the sedimentation really occurred in the river itself. So it increased in uh, bed elevation by a meter and a half in some places. So again, to just give you a visual, um, here's the mouth of the river and you're in, uh, going upstream, uh, former Glines Canyon Dam, former Elwha Dam right over here. So I'll just show you how the stream bed actually changed visually here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how the stream bed in the main river changed here. And then I'll talk a little bit about something called floodplain channels. So for every kilometer of main stem that you could see here, there's about two kilometers of something called smaller floodplain channels throughout the Elwha. So under that forested canopy, there's actually quite a bit of fish habitat that's really important for juvenile uh, salmon rearing. And I'll show you a little bit about how wood and, and gravel have developed in certain areas. So if you were standing in the lower river in September of 2011, you would see basically large, uh, basically anything from the size of a baseball to a basketball. Now in April of 2012, you would see much finer material, sand and silt and clay in combination with the softballs and, and basketballs. And then by August of 2012, when gravel started to be transported downstream from the upper river, you would actually start seeing golf ball sized material. And this is the stuff that salmon actually like to spawn in for the most part. So how has the river uh, built up over time? So the black, the, the green line denotes what the riverbed looked like. So these dips here are basically pools. So you're going from upstream to downstream here. And the black line denotes where the riverbed is in November 2012. So from July 2011 to November 2012. 
And you can see that all the pools actually have filled in in the middle river here. So basically everything filled in. And not only did the pools fill in, but something called riffles filled in. And so when we get a change in the elevation of the river, it's that riffle crest which actually controls the elevation of, of, the, of the water that you see a lot of times. And so that will actually change how water flows into the floodplain as well. So again, just a visual, this is what the floodplain channels looked like. Um, this is a place called Boston Charlie in 97, and this is what it looked like in 2013. So a certain amount of sediment definitely filled in the floodplain itself. And this just gives you an example from another place. So this is what the bed looked like. Water is going from the top to the bottom here. And the majority of it was cobbled sized material. So again, about softball to basketball sized material. And you can see with this coloration here, about half a meter of bed filling or aggradation occurred. And you can see that gravel actually came in as well. So for the main river, um, this is just an example of how it changed substantially. So here we're looking at it in August 2011 on the left. And you can see that by February of 2013 on the right, you can start seeing these large gravel bars being developed. And also there's an accumulation of wood. Now wood's pretty important in these river systems because it helps establish fish habitat and stabilize some of the, uh, the area there. So when we kind of look at the whole picture as a budget, if you will, the majority of sediment that has been released has basically made it out to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. It's not that long from the uh, upper dam down to the mouth of the river. I'm guessing it's about, um, about 20 kilometers. So um, anyway, you can see that a portion of it is in the middle river and then in the lower river. So about 10% of it roughly stayed in the river with the rest of it essentially going out the river mouth, some of it staying and developing that um, delta that I showed you and some of it actually becoming part of the longshore drift and, and moving away. So one of the main reasons why this was done was to increase salmon populations over time. So a lot of the questions that we get is how long will it take salmon to colonize and establish spawn, uh, spawning populations. I'm not going to go into that today, um, but what I am going to tell you about is where we thought the fish would go um, and by species and how many more fish there might, might be and how we're actually measuring the change because that's a really challenging task in an environment where you can't really see in the river itself and then what we've seen so far. So we developed some basic models that predict where fish go in the watershed. So if you remember the lower, the dams were down over here. So we tried to predict by species based on the habitat conditions that they, that they like, where they would go. So there's water, there's places in the watershed where um, there's these valleys such as Geyser Valley where it's conducive to all species. And then as you go further upstream, it might be more conducive to certain species. So the line thickness tells us how favorable it is for a specific species. So for Chinook, it might not be as favorable as it is for steelhead and coho in this case. So we've developed pretty simple models also to estimate what we think the population size will be as a result of the dam removal. Um, so if you remember, the population size for Chinook salmon right now is about a couple thousand on average. Um, we've had some good years over the last couple of years due to ocean conditions. We think it can get anywhere between roughly 15 to 20,000 fish. And again, one of my job is to figure out how we actually measure this. And it's challenging because of a couple of reasons. One is we don't have a lot of species of animals in the Northwest, but what we do have is animals that come in at different times and they do different, have different life history strategies. Um, and so one of the, we have to measure actually what occurs by their different life stages. So this is the adult life stage for salmon. So when we look at the different species that we have, they're coming in at different seasons and we have different flow conditions and so that means we have to use different methods to actually measure how many of them there are. So for Chinook salmon that are coming in in the summer, for example, it's a little bit easier because the water is low and clear as opposed to now when steelhead might be coming in when the water is high and more turbid. So one of the ways we're measuring uh, fish returning is uh, using sonar, so basically sound waves. Um, and these little devices cost an arm and a leg. This one's about $80,000, I think. Um, so there's a high initial cost, but the benefit of having something like this is that you actually get pretty accurate numbers. 
and we're able to put it down low in the river so we have two sites here because the river is split into two channels down here to actually measure how many fish return and are spawning in the upper watershed. So this is what uh, one of the sonar sites looks like. Um, this is a weir to kind of push the fish to a certain area so that when we actually uh, send the beam out, it's only covering uh, a certain amount of area. And this is what the data actually looks like. So this is the number of fish passing um, with these bars in each day. And then the, the line basically denotes the total number over time or the cumulative. And you can see that we have these dark bars here. And what that means is that something occurred, whether the, mach the, the, um, the sonar wasn't able to work, whether the flow was too high and we have to get it out of the river. You don't want to see an $80,000 piece of equipment floating downstream. That's definitely something you don't want. So, um, and that's something that we have to really take care of. Um, but what's really nice about this is that we're actually getting accurate numbers. Um, and we're also able to put error bars around those numbers. And I know that doesn't sound like a big deal, but in our business, there's a lot of uncertainty in measuring fish. And the joke is fish are just like trees to measure, except you can't see them and they move all the time. So um, that, that makes it pretty challenging to actually come up with a population estimate. And so having um, error bars around this to give an people an idea of the uncertainty is, in, is really important. The other reason it's important is that we can actually take that uncertainty, that error, if you will, and figure out what's it due to. And it varies by year. So in 2012, we had higher flows um, in the river, and we had to pull the sonar a number of times so that way it didn't basically get uh, torn out. So as a result, we had to actually fill, we had a lot of data gaps. Where in 2013, we didn't. Um, and there, actually, what happened is that we lost some funding and we lost one of our observers who was very good. So the observer error went up. So these are real-life scenarios where um, people want to know how many fish, but to kind of get that number, it varies each year based on a lot of things. And so actually, we can get better over time at measuring things if we understand where we're having error occur. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the middle Elwha. So in 2000, um, August, April of 2012, the lower dam was out. So the middle Elwha between the two dams was available to fish. Um, and some of the fish include steelhead, uh, which is a picture right here. Basically, that's an ocean-going rainbow trout. Uh, coho salmon, um, Chinook salmon, and pink salmon. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what uh, the, the various uh, groups involved, including the Lower Elwha Tribe, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and National Park Service have been doing in relation to the dam removal. Um, one thing is that fish were relocated actually prior to the dam removal to give them a, uh, a jump start. So these are fish that were returning to the Lower River, Coho in this case, that were released in three locations. Um, so that by the time the dam came out in the spring, their offspring could actually go downstream. So um, this is a map uh, or a, a Google image of uh, water flowing from the bottom to the top. And these circles are spawning nests, or reds as they're called. So these are all locations where a male and a female actually spawned in the, in the river or as tributaries. Um, so we have two tributaries coming into the, to the Elwha. Um, I forgot to point out here, sorry. We have the Little River, which is on the right here. And right across, we have Indian Creek coming in. And so these fish uh, found this clear water environment and spawned in these areas. Um, some of them actually spawned in the river itself as well in its floodplain channels. Some steelhead were moved in the spring of 2012 as well. So this gives you an idea that the steelhead population is quite a bit smaller um, than the coho population. But not only did we get, and, and then we actually tried to track where these fish actually spawned. And you can see the majority of them spawning to the right here, or that's the little river coming in. But we also got natural recruits. And the reason that we knew that is because all the fish that were moved were actually tagged with an external tag that you could visually see. So they were. Um, so these are fish that actually, within a couple weeks of that lower dam coming out, found their way into uh, the Little River and also Indian Creek. And this is actually a, a, a female digging her nest right here. So Chinook salmon, which were kind of uh, considered the you know a prize fish at the uh, at the time before dam removal. There's stories and lore about the big Chinook that used to return to the uh, Elwha up to 100 pounds. 
Um, so one of the things that uh, occurred since the dam removal is that we've seen quite a few Chinook spawning in the middle Elwha. So here's where former Glines was, water's flowing again from right to the left. And the red dots denote the 2002 spawning nests and the black dots denote the 2013 spawning nests. And so it just gives you an idea of where these fish actually spawned and at what density. So you can see that there was quite a few spawning nests in that middle Elwha. Um, so the population levels for Chinook have rebounded, not necessarily due to the dam removal, it was just somewhat fortuitous at this point uh, where we had good ocean conditions and the number of fish that returned were the highest we've seen in about 20 years. Um, so, you know, where the typical average was around 2,000, the last two years we've seen it around 4,000. So that's good news for the Elwha because then these fish have an opportunity to spawn naturally in the middle river. So this gives you an idea of how the number of nests have increased over time in the middle river by species. Um, again, going from four, zero in 2011 um, for, and then 400 up to about uh, 1,400 um, this last year. And we tried to make predictions before the dam removal based on other recolonization events. So this isn't the first time that salmon have recolonized an area. So we just looked at the data from other places about population growth rates and other things. And we tried to estimate what they were um, relative to what we found. And so far it's been pretty good. Um, but, you know, everybody can get lucky and that's what I say. So I think we just got lucky on that one. So I talked to you a little bit about the adult life stage and how we were measuring that. So one of the things that measures productivity from a river system from a salmon perspective is the juvenile life stage. So how many fish are actually migrating out of these river systems? And again, we have the same issues surrounding how do we measure those, different, different methods, different species coming out at different times. So one of the things that we do is we don dry suits and we actually go in and we, and we count uh, juvenile fish um, and this is the little river here, basically going from a, a, a natural barrier here at basically river kilometer 4.7 down in the mouth. Oh, I'm sorry, this is actually the number of adult spawning nests here. Um, so you can see where the adult spawning nests are. Um, and this is, we do this with visual surveys where we actually walk the stream. And you can see that there's places where there were no adults. And then we went back um, once the juveniles were spawned out of the gravels to actually enumerate with dry suits um, where we actually saw fish. And you can see these gray boxes. Well, so that's the juveniles dispersing from where they were spawned and actually colonizing that new area. So a lot of times when we think of colonization, people think, well, the adults have to come back. In reality, it's also juveniles. Um, the juveniles can actually colonize new areas as well. So we may see adults in only a couple places, but we can see juveniles up to two to three kilometers from where they respond. So the other thing we're trying to do is get an idea of the population estimate um, in areas. So we have 15 sites across the middle Elwha that we've been uh, measuring using something called a mark and recapture technique where we tag these fish and then we recapture them to get an idea of the population size. And uh, one of the results that we've seen to date is that um, immediately we started seeing anatomous fish. So we obviously had resident fish, fish that spent their entire life in these rivers beforehand. But once those barriers were disconnected, we started seeing anatomous fish, which would be coho and chinook. And it gets a little fuzzy with the rainbow and cutthroat because their life history can go either way. In other words, uh, a rainbow trout can stay and be a rainbow trout for its entire life in freshwater or it could become a steelhead. So, um, but at the bottom line is about 20% of the fish that we saw and probably more were anadromous right away. So we're trying to measure, um, another thing we're trying to do is measure when they go out to sea. So we're trying to measure when they reside in the freshwater and this is just a very simple schematic of the Elwha flowing from uh, left to right in this case and here's Little River and Indian Creek. The red dots denote something called the screw trap. And basically this is an, a, a, a floating barge in the river that has an Archimedes screw on it that when these fish are migrating out as something called smolts um, to the sea to rear in the, in the salt water, we actually trap them and we can actually count how many are coming out. And um, one of the things that I mentioned before is that with salmon and where we live, we don't have a lot of species, but we have something called life history strategies. So if you're a coho salmon, for example, juvenile, you could stay up to one year, and most do, 
in the fresh water before you go out for 18 months or so and come back as an adult. Or you can go out immediately, right coming out of the gravels as a fry, and, and move out. And the environmental condition of, of the place will actually dictate what you do. So what we see here are the two creeks, Indian Creek and Little River. Um, and you can see that in uh, Indian Creek, we have about the same number of something called fry per spawner. So this is the number of little ones that are going out before the, not residing for more than a couple months out to sea. Out to sea. Um, and then uh, the number of spawners we have. And then these are small. So these are fish that are much bigger. So the little ones are about 35 to 55 millimeters going out. The bigger ones are about 100 millimeters going out. But um, what you can see here is that it's very different in Little River uh, than Indian Creek, where in Little River we see a lot of these fish going out right away. And so the average across uh, the, the Pacific Rim is somewhere about here for migrating fry and about here for smolts. So then why do these animals do this? Why do you do different things? And the reason that they do different things is that they don't know necessarily, as a, from a population perspective, what life history strategy is going to succeed. And so you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. It's kind of like a portfolio for stocks. You don't put everything in one thing. You do a couple of different things. So that way you're building some resilience in case something happens. And um, nature does the same thing. And one of the reasons why this happens is that in Little River, the optimal temperatures are far less. It's a much colder system than Indian Creek. So um, in these colder systems, what we typically see is fish not necessarily sticking around, but perhaps migrating out to more optimal <coughs> excuse me, locations. Whereas in Indian Creek, you can see that the optimal temperature range is almost 75% of the time. And we've documented other species. Uh, this is Pacific lamprey that we found in Indian Creek. So this is something that um, uh, we weren't seeing a lot, and now we're seeing them. And everybody has a different reaction to this. A lot of people say, that's really interesting. Other people like, get that off the screen right away, because that's a really ugly animal. Um, the other one is sockeye salmon. So one of the things that we have is a lake, uh, Lake Sutherland, which is a natural lake. And sockeye need uh, lakes to actually spawn, beaches to spawn in. And we're seeing them return. And we're seeing different life history strategies. This is actually the first summer steelhead. Um, so it's steelhead typically return in our area as winter fish. So anywhere from December to, um, let's say, June. Um, and this fish, we have something called a summer steelhead, which would return sometime in the fall and spend the entire winter in fresh water before it spawns in the spring. And this is uh, one of those fish, actually, in Little River. So there's a lot of other things going on. Uh, there's a revegetation plan that's being led up by the Lower Elwha Tribe and the National Park Service, um, where they have a seven-year plan of replanting and then also monitoring natural revegetation that occurs. And, um, when you see these terraces, what happens is that we have a forest next to these, um, these former reservoir surfaces. And as you go away from your seed source, um, you decline in terms of density and diversity of, of, uh, of plants. And some of the more important variables include moisture, stream texture, and distance from the forest. And Josh Chenoweth and um, Michael McHenry have been leading this effort up. So this gives you an idea of what's happened over time from 2012 to 2014 in the finer material. So anywhere we have finer material in the reservoir, it seems like the bare ground has decreased considerably. Um, so we have kind of the growing conditions that work well. In the coarser material, not so much. Um, so you can see here where you're starting at about 83% and it's down to 66%. So these are just from different plots across the different reservoirs. And then also we have evasive species in the area that they're dealing with. So this just gives you a map of where the evasives are occurring in the upper reservoir in Mills. So just to summarize the revegetation, that there's natural revegetation that's being established, particularly in the finer sediments. Um, and uh, in the coarser sediments, it's proving to be a little bit more difficult and drawn out in terms of what's happening there. So now I'm going to talk about the food web. So this is basically the, the food source for fish. And so uh, this gives you an idea of the food web here. Um, so I want you to focus in the lower left-hand corner. This is work being led up by Sarah Morley and Jeff Duda. So the substrate has changed considerably, as uh, I've shown you. And that's going to affect 
basically how algae or, or periphyton grows uh, on the riverbed, how secondary consumers such as uh, mayflies and stoneflies and caddisflies uh, grow, and then obviously that's going to affect the food resource for the fish that live there. So there's a pretty simple study design that uh, Sarah and Jeff have used. They broke up the river into three locations, the lower, the middle, and the upper, into different habitat types, the main river, the floodplain channels or side channels, and the tributaries. And I'm just going to focus on the middle and lower river today to give you an idea of what's happened. So we've seen a pretty dramatic reduction in the benthic invert density. So that's just basically how many bugs we're seeing on the actual stream bed itself. Um, in the lower river in particular, 95% reduction. Um, this data is from 2012, so this is reduced also in the middle now. 2012, we still had Glines Canyon Dam in, just as a caveat, so things didn't really change as much. But you can see in the lower river, we saw a really dramatic decline in the density of, of, of uh, basically aquatic insects. And the species composition changed as well. So this is what we had prior to dam removal. So we had non-insects and um, dipterans, which are basically flies, and then we have stoneflies and mayflies. You can see the density really decreasing in that area quite a bit. Not a surprise if you change the entire substrate of a river. Um, we've also seen the drift change. So the stuff I was just showing you is the bed of the river. So there's stuff in the water column, it's called drift. And uh, these are basically drifting insects, and that's really the food source for most fish. Um, you can see there were dramatic declines, particularly in the lower river during certain seasons, such as the spring. So the diet has changed too. Um, where before what we saw, um, prior to dam removal, this is the percent of terrestrial. So what that means is that you have aquatic insects and terrestrial insects that, that fish eat. And for the most part, prior to dam removal, you would see that 70 to 80% of the diet was going to be aquatic insects basically floating through the water column. But what's happened since then is that um, because the densities of the aquatic insects has been reduced, the terrestrial insects have kind of taken over in terms of the diet source. So you can see here the proportion of terrestrial really increased. And that's a natural increase anyway. Um, the tributaries are kind of like controls because they haven't been affected by the sediment. But nevertheless, we've seen a dramatic increase in the percent that's uh, terrestrial in terms of their diet. I, I, the analogy I like to make is like, if you go to a uh, supermarket, there might be 30 kinds of cereal, right? So you're going to kind of pick and choose which one you like. But let's say you go to a market where there's, you know, somewhere else and there's only one kind of cereal. Well, guess what? That's what you're going to eat. So that's kind of what's happened here to a certain degree. So just to sum up, we've seen a reduction in the benthic invert, but we think that's going to bounce back at some point, obviously, um, and a shift in the composition. So we've seen a lot of the traditional um, insects kind of go down in, in, uh, in, in terms of their uh, numbers, um, a change in the drift as well, um, and a more, more of a, uh, uh, a change over to a terrestrial diet more than an aquatic diet for these fish. So some of the coolest stuff that's happened is because of the salmon coming back and something called marine-derived nutrients. So these are nutrients of uh, nitrogen and carbon that have a signature uh, from the ocean, um, heavier isotope signature, and uh, some work that's being done by Chris Tonra um, looking at how dippers, which um, basically live along the river, have been affected by this. And this is a picture by John McMillan, who's done a lot of work out there. And you can see this is a salmon egg, actually, right there. And this is an insect in the mouth here. So we measure, uh, you know, through, the, through basically the feathers and other things, we can actually get an idea of the isotope signature, both nitrogen on the y-axis and then carbon on the x-axis here. And basically anything in this circle here is, tells us that these are areas where there's anadromous fish. So it has a higher isotope signature for nitrogen um, and carbon as well. And these are areas without basically anadromous fish. And what's happened is that in the middle river, um, since dam removal, um, we've seen an increase in uh, basically the nitrogen isotope um, in both BR, which is breeding season, and NB in non-breeding season. So we've seen an increase in, in that signature in the birds themselves, and we've also seen a shift where these birds would actually migrate more. And, um, and again, Chris is doing mark recapture. He's got these birds banded. 
what he's finding is that these birds are actually staying in these locations for a longer time period. So, you know, obviously attracted to perhaps one hypothesis is the food resources available. Um, another thing that's changed is the animal response, uh, river otters. So a lot, a lot cuter than a lamprey, that's for sure. Um, anyway, um, so what they've been trying to do, um, Kim Sager Fratkin from the Lower Elwha tribe has been basically trapping uh, uh, some of these uh, river otters and then um, actually uh, putting in uh, radio tags, taking blood samples for genetics and um, clipping nails for isotopes and then releasing the animals again. And um, this just gives you, a, this is just a, a cool map that shows uh, where these animals are, these individual animals. So the red denotes uh, a particular female that lived in the upper watershed that eventually actually made her way downstream and all the way over uh, to Port Angeles and back. So it gives you an idea of where these animals are actually located. And so what we're seeing is that um, you're seeing a different isotope signature as a function of how much time these animals spend in the different uh, ecosystems. So the upper right here are basically um, otters that uh, use the Strait of Juan de Fuca as well as the lower Elwha, so they constantly have a, a marine food resource. Um, the bottom left here are just the river otters that that stayed above the dam. And then we've seen a shift of those animals somewhere here in between where they're starting to utilize that. So we're seeing a change in, in, in um, um, that isotope signature as well. So just to sum up for you, um, uh, the dams, basically the dam removal is complete and about 40% of the total store, stored sediment has been released as of 2013. That I, I can never give you an accurate number because it's constantly changing. Um, uh, but that's what it was as of October 2013, so probably more than half now. Reservoirs are being revegetated both naturally as well as um, with restoration efforts. Um, the biggest, most dramatic habitat shift has been this prograding delta. So now we have tidal channels where we haven't had those before or haven't had them in 100 years. Um, about 10% of the sediment is stored in the main river itself. The riverbed has built up about one to two meters and the floodplain channels have filled and have accumulated sediment. Um, we've seen adult salmon make it past the uh, Elwha Dam site and actually we've seen at least uh, four Chinook make it past uh, the Glines Canyon Dam site. So we actually had fish this fall as soon as the dam was out. We had some fish move above there. Um, and so we're seeing an increase in the number of spawning nests in the Middle River. We're seeing juveniles dispersed to new habitats. Um, and we're seeing the salmon productivity varying as a function of the environmental condition. Remember I mentioned to you the stream temperature idea and how that affects life histories. And then we're seeing new species um, being documented in new life histories. Um, and then for the reveg, we're seeing more success in the finer sediments. It's taking longer in the coarse sediments and then um, the evasive species thing is something that they're trying to get a handle on as well. Um, we've seen a shift in the food web, a reduction in the, in, the, in the bugs on the stream bed, as well as in the drift or in the water column, and we've seen a shift in terms of what these animals are eating to more terrestrial preys. And then we're seeing the, the terrestrial food web affected, both dippers, um, so there's uh, nitrogen pathways both for during breeding season as well as non-breeding season. And then we're seeing how river otters are actually affected by the, the change as well. And with that, I can take any questions. So thank you. OK, we have time to take a couple questions for George. And uh, sakov has got the mic, so just raise your hand. and. Um, Much smaller dams, low head dams, 
So, so the, the thing, thing about, about the Yawa that's a little bit different is that it's a much larger, larger dam, much larger dam, it's 100 to 200 feet. Most, most of the dam rule that, that has occurred have been dams that have been like maybe 10 to 15 feet or lower, you know, in terms of size. But people are evaluating it because um, there's going to be dams that are going to stay in for quite some time simply because they are a source of energy for us. But there's other dams that have outlived their lifespan. And so I think that we can actually look um, kind of as a society and say, oh, well, you know, what are the values of keeping something there versus not? So some of the dams that have come out over the last 10 years have been for safety purposes. So part of the reason that this came out was not only the ecosystem act, but there were safety issues related to it. Um, for people downstream. So yeah, it's becoming more prevalent in terms of people thinking about it um, and the benefits. So some of the things that are challenging with this though is that um, in some cases we might have exotic species upstream that actually can then migrate downstream and that people don't want. So there's a variety of different situations. And so while we're learning a lot from the Elwha, one of the challenges that we have as a kind of a science community is how much does this translate to anywhere else? You know, so a lot of it right now has been case studies, and we're trying to set it up so that we could actually do this at a larger scale to kind of come with general take-home messages for people. Okay, one more question here in the back on the right. You, you raised the question of take-home messages. Uh, what kind of societal uh, comments were made when you start off with these nice pretty lights? And you drain the lake and all of a sudden you got these terrible floodplains and all this erosion, all this dirt moving around, and you don't see immediate quote improvements in the water quality or fish or whatever. What kind of issues have you seen with that and response? So that's, so that's a really, really good question. question. Can, Can we, we turn, turn it down? down? Thank, Thank you. you. Um, um, sorry, I'm just loud, so um yeah, yeah, so that's, that's a really a good, good question. question. Um, people, people were very, very concerned, concerned about the water quality issues associated with this. And um, as, as a result, result there was a lot of uh, building of infrastructure to deal with the water quality issues um, and also to deal with the fact that salmon might just be dying off because of the sedimentation. And so there's been uh, hatcheries that have been built and other things that are part of this whole process. Um, I think what we've learned as take home messages, at least for this place, is that we have a relatively clean source of sediment because it's coming from a national park. So it's not like upstream there was uh, pulp and paper mills that for years were kind of putting things into the sediment and other things and now that's being released. So relatively cleaner source of material. We've seen that the river, because it actually has a floodplain connected to the main river, and it still has a somewhat forested environment, was able to handle a lot of that sediment quite well. So in other words, the capacity of a river system to mobilize the sediment and to uh, store the sediment has been much higher than what people thought. Um, you know, there's obviously water quality issues in terms of the turbidity levels that we're seeing. But on the whole, I think that one of the take home messages that is that if you have functioning parts of a river system, like the main river to the floodplain, and you have a natural uh, hydrologic regime, rivers can process sediment pretty quickly and pretty well. Um, so that's one thing that we've learned so far, which was not expected, I don't think. I think a lot of people thought that it would be much more difficult. There's a couple of unexpected things that happened was um, where we did have water quality issues. Is you don't know what's underneath the reservoir. And so uh, happened in April of 2012 or 2013, I don't remember when, but I think it was 2012, there was a pulse of organic material that came out. And that really caused problems for the water treatment facility because nobody really predicted like a big pulse of organic material. So this is finer like wood and just the detritus that was uh, in the reservoir surface itself. And nobody really thought about that or thought knew where it was, but that actually had a pretty big impact um, for like a period of a couple of weeks to a month. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's definitely unexpected things that happen too. But I think the bottom line though is that these are natural systems and if it's natural enough, then they can process things that, that occur like sediment. Okay, one last question here. Yeah, uh, I'm from Penn State University. Great presentation. I'm Thanks. a fisher. I don't even think I've ever gone fishing without a net, but um, this was fabulous. I fell in love. My question actually ties in nicely with your previous question, 
And I was wondering about your outlet of the mouth of the river where you have the sediments growing, and whether looking back 100 years, 200 years, whether there was a delta there before because the sediment from upstream was blocked from getting that far. That's, That's a really good, good question. question. Yeah, yeah, so we so looked at um, something called the general land office notes. So back at the turn of the century, there was quite a few surveys done across the Pacific Northwest. And there was, in fact, a delta there. And over the last 100 years or so, basically, that sediment has eroded because the, there was no uh, sediment to re-nourish that area. So that area, historically, um, not only from the maps, but just from uh, anecdotal information from people that lived there, that you could walk from, basically, the Elwha to Port Angeles along the beach. You couldn't do, you can't do that anymore. Um, but now that, that it's being kind of re-nourished with the sediment, we're seeing just really dramatic changes and uh, don't necessarily know if it's gonna look like what it did historically. That's, that's one thing that um, you can't go back in time. And so it's a different trajectory, but you can still get the elements of it. I mean, one of the things that's really amazing is that if you went out to the Elwha before the dam removal and you heard the, just, standing there listening, closing your eyes, you would hear the rumble of big rock. You know, so not like a beach you would hear in North Carolina would be like this nice fine wave sound, right? But now you go out to the Elwha, and that was one of the first things that I noticed when the sediment actually started coming in. It just changes the, the kind of noise that you even hear. So the fact that we're seeing Dungeness crab and other things in there makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, we're seeing some of those elements of what was historically there, but also something different too. Thank you. Okay, let's thank you.